Hello. This video is meant to be an introduction to vertebrates, at least the first part of that, starting with the ancestors of uh, vertebrates and then going through amphibians. This is meant to introduce uh, this concept in a comparative vertebrate anatomy course. As such, it is meant to be introductory. Um, as I uh, mentioned different groups, it would be wonderful to talk about the groups in greater detail and about their anatomy, their, their skeletons, their brains, their hearts. Um, but this lecture is meant to introduce kind of the, the framework, the scaffolding of uh, these groups so that future discussions of vertebrate skeletons, vertebrate hearts, vertebrate brains makes sense uh, in this context. And I'd like to just kind of jump in in just a second with the fun part, with the idea that after going through the fun part, you know, then some of the definitions might be better um, understood rather than beginning with the, the definitions. Um, and so one of the things I'd like to just mention, but then kind of uh, reintroduce at the end of uh, the second type or the, the second part is the idea of classification. Uh, so biologists, we want to talk about uh, different uh, organisms, but given that there's millions of organisms known on uh, the planet, and you know, if you round about 70,000 species of vertebrates, oh, like how would we study their anatomy? It would be exhausting. My students in human anatomy and physiology take two semesters to study one species, humans. Uh, you know, how much time would it take to study 70,000 species of vertebrates? It would be exhausting. Uh, well, there's good news on uh, this uh, front. Uh, the good news is that if we can put organisms into groups, uh, if these are real biological groups, this helps us. We could study, you know, the vertebrate skeletal system, the mammalian muscles, uh, the primate brain, and this would then make sense. So when we look at the phylum chordata, chordates, it's a biological group. And one of the reasons to put organisms in a biological group is that they share features. All right, and so once you learn the features of one chordate, this would help you then understand um, the features of another uh, uh, chordate. And so you don't have to study seven, uh, 70,000 um, different uh, species. Once you learn that chordates share the feature of pharyngeal arches, slits in the throat in at least part of their life cycle. You could then make a hypothesis about, let's say, a vertebrate you don't know. You know, let's say there's a mammal you've never studied or, you know, reptile you've never studied. You could make the hypothesis that uh, at some point of its life, you know, perhaps only during embryonic development, it would develop pharyngeal arches, slits in the throat. It would develop a postanal tail. It would have a notochord and it would turn out you would be right. So here you are, you're making a prediction about anatomical features, which turns out to be right just based on a group. If the members of this group share this feature, then that can be applied to all of the members of the group, even if there's thousands, tens of thousands uh, uh, of them. So uh, that's one of the reasons to seek out these uh, groups. Now, in biology, we have big groups and then we have little groups. What I will then, at the end of the second part, say is a nested hierarchy of groups within groups. So it's not necessarily, you don't have to choose. Am I a, a vertebrate or am I a mammal or am I a primate? You could be all three of them because vertebrates could be a big group, all right? Mammals could be a smaller group within the uh, vertebrates and primates could be a smaller group within the mammals. So uh, there's all sorts of groups which we uh, could uh, name. And once again, at the end of the second, uh, the second part, I'll get back to this. But for example, you could say, ah, we have a big uh, group called a kingdom. All right, and we could say, oh, that's the, the animals, for example, would be the kingdom of uh, uh, that uh, we humans uh, belong uh, to. Turns out there's a lot of other organisms on uh, uh, the planet. So this bacterium is not an animal. This yeast is not an animal. Um, the, um, I'll make this big for a second. Um, the, 
uh, plants and fungi, they're not animals. So there's all sorts of living uh, things which are not animals. Um, but the things that we put together in the group animals, they share features. They are multicellular. They get their energy from uh, ingesting other organisms. Now, they could be microscopic organisms the, the way this sponge would do, or, you know, whether it be a shark or a tiger, you know, uh, uh, a more a macroscopic uh, type of uh, prey. Um, the cells have collagen as their uh, major extracellular protein that they cling to that allows them to be uh, multicellular. Uh, there are you know, genes that they share like the receptor tyrosine kinases. In any case, kingdom is a big group. So vertebrates uh, belong to the kingdom animalia. They are not plants, fungi, protists, uh, or uh, bacteria. Um, and as such, they share uh, features uh, with uh, other uh, animals. Within uh, th uh, those animals, we could uh, break uh, into a number of uh, groups. Let's just pick uh, the, one, the ones whose names are most familiar, you know, very often being taught uh, in, um, in elementary schools and high schools. So uh, we could uh, break the kingdom into groups known as phyla. And so here we have the phylum chordata, uh, the chordates, all right? So vertebrates are chordates because they have a notochord and uh, other uh, features, all right? And so then we have this phylum of uh, chordates. Um, the vertebrates would be classified as a sub Phylum. So once again, uh, just we have lots of terms that we could use, and so we can have a phylum, subphylum. Uh, once I introduce terms like order, there can be suborder, a superorder, infraorder. So you know, let me just you know give a few uh, terms. Um, and so uh, the vertebrates are a subphylum of the phylum chordata, and there's a number of uh, different. Uh, uh, groups within that phylum, uh, which we can call a class. And as I go through the history in just a few minutes, we'll go through a number of uh, classes. Um, but the ones which humans would uh, pertain to um, would uh, be the class mammalia. So humans would not be classified with the jawless fish or with the um, cartilaginous fish or with the bony teleost fish or with the bony sarcopterygian fish. We would not be classified with uh, reptiles or amphibians, but instead we would be mammals. And so notice that this is a subgroup. The colored area here um, is smaller than the group that originally contained all of the chordates. So chordates is a phylum, a big group. Um, sorry, so the mammals would be a class, a subgroup of uh, the, uh, the phylum uh, chordata. And then we could start breaking mammals into smaller and smaller uh, groups, uh, as we'll see. But one of the uh, groups, which once again, a, a term which uh, might have been introduced, you know, in, uh, you know, say high school biology, uh, would be the idea of an order, All right, So there's lots of orders of mammals within this class. And so, you know, some would be rodents, some would be bats, some would be hoofed animals, some would be carnivores. Um, et cetera. Um, but the one which we uh, humans would be most interested in would be the primates, right? So the primates are a subgroup of uh, the mammals. So if mammals is a class, then primates are an uh, order. Now there's lots of different types of uh, primates. And so we could break the order into uh, families. And uh, so, uh, uh, there is a family known as hominidae, uh, which is a family which includes um, what are known as the uh, higher apes. That would include orangutans, gorillas, chimps, and then humans as well. Uh, so we are uh, in the same family as, uh, as uh, those apes. And then within the family, there would be subfamilies, and then there would be different um, genera and different species. So a genus is a subgroup of a family. So we are the genus Homo. Uh, we are the only living uh, 
uh, members of Homo alive today, but there were previous uh, species that has we'll get into. Uh, and Homo sapiens is our species, which distinguishes us from Homo neanderthalus, uh, from the Denisovans, uh, from Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and uh, others. And so as I go through this introduction into the uh, vertebrates, one of the things we'll key on is this idea of, um, of classification and of uh, groups. Once again, why would we care about groups? Well, perhaps these images uh, can help us. If you had to identify the say muscles of a bird or of an opossum or of a mammal like a cat, a goat, uh, a sheep, uh, etc. After a while, you know, you certainly get, you find it very daunting. Once again, my anatomy and physiology students who study human anatomy, they feel that the, there's a fair amount of difficulty in mastering the anatomy of just one species, uh, humans. Uh, so why would we want to study, you know, all of of these other species, how could we manage it? Well, the beauty is because those groups that I just mentioned, they share features. Look at these mammals, look at the arms, all right? So, you know, in the arm, there's a biceps brachii, a triceps brachii, uh, a brachialis. Those are the same muscles as we find in humans that we find in this monkey, all right? Um, and so even if you were to look at animals which use their arms differently than I do. So for example, this goat is walking on its hands, um, but it still has the same muscles, the triceps, the brachialis, the deltoid uh, that I would have in uh, my arm. And the same would be true of this cat. This bird, which is flying with its arms has the same muscles. So as we study anatomy, this then is just you know, it's, it's wonderful for us. We don't have to try to memorize 70,000 body plans. Instead, as we study these, um, uh, uh, these uh, groups, uh, then the hope is uh, that what we learn about one group can then be applied uh, to uh, others. So this idea of grouping of, of taxonomy or cladistics, how we classify uh, life, that uh, is a key, particularly uh, the vertebrates. A second topic which is uh, key is the idea of time. So um, it is possible as we you know, look at hypotheses about how the natural world might work, it is possible that if we were to go back to the beginning of life on earth, that we would essentially see life as it exists now. So there would be bluebirds and gray squirrels and people and garter snakes and tree frogs and bass and flounder, you know, et cetera. That is not what we observe, however. So if you were to look at those groups, you know, which I just kind of uh, introduced um, and say, all right, when in the history of earth, so if we have a history of Earth starting at the beginning at the bottom and we go up to the modern day, when are all of these uh, groups known? Um, the surprising thing is that um, Earth was once very different than it is uh, today. So uh, for about uh, a billion years, there was no life on Earth at all that we can find trace of. Once um, there was life on Earth, for a third of its history, that would be about a billion and a half years, the only living things were bacteria, which are the simplest living things alive today. Um, later, there were more complex cells, what we call the eukaryotic cell, um, but they first appear a little uh, prior to two billion years uh, ago. But we don't reliably get animals until say 700 million years ago. And so if our planet is 4.6 billion years old, um, these sponges um, and cnidarians would represent the simplest animals. There are no animals prior to, you know, between six and 700 million years. Uh, so animals are relatively new in the history of Earth, if you consider its entire history. Uh, now, in a study of vertebrates, uh, we are not looking at mollusks and arthropods, uh, et cetera. Instead, we want to focus on fish and amphibians. Um, but here then we see that all of vertebrate history fits into the last 540 million years. 
So most of Earth's history has had zero vertebrates in it. Uh, we split the history of our planet into different uh, time periods known as eons, and it is only in the most recent eon, the Phanerozoic eon, that all vertebrate history uh, is condensed. The previous uh, eons uh, all have one thing in common, they have zero uh, vertebrates. Now, once again, uh, the point that I'm making here, this is just kind of a preliminary um, uh, point, uh, this becomes uh, clearer at, at the end of uh, this pair of uh, lectures, uh, so I will get back to it. Um, but uh, if you were to say, all right, he's, or, here are invertebrates, I'll get the vertebrates in just a second. Um, these are things that are odd. We don't know these, they're not alive today. They're called trilobites. Um, so what's going on with these trilobites? Why don't we know them? Well, it turns out that if we took this eon uh, the Phanerozoic Eon, uh, which is the only eon which has vertebrates, we could split it into uh, eras, uh, like this Paleozoic Era, which starts at 540 million years ago and then goes to 250 million years ago. It's called the old life because, you know, these living things, they don't resemble, you know, um, uh, what's alive today uh, very uh, much. And this is when the trilobites lived. All trilobites are known only from the Paleozoic era. So as we look at the history of life on Earth, and we'll get to uh, the vertebrates, um, it's like human history. So if you were to study the Egyptian pharaohs, uh, the Huns, the Ming dynasty, you know, George Washington and the colonial army, um, all of these have specific moments in history that they have existed. And we find the same with groups of uh, animals. So trilobites in general, are only known from this one era, the Paleozoic era. And different subgroups of uh, trilobites, different families are known only from uh, you know, a distinctive what are called periods. So this era then gets split into periods, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, the Carboniferous, and the Permian. And when we study vertebrates, we then see the same. So there are jawless vertebrates which are not alive today. They are called ostracoderms. Um, they only existed in the Paleozoic era not the Mesozoic era with the dinosaurs, not the Cenozoic era with the diversity of uh, mammal groups, just in the Paleozoic era. And they don't live during the entire Paleozoic era, they only live in specific periods, all right? And that would then be uh, the same of uh, other uh, vertebrate uh, groups, which we will get to uh, as, uh, as well. And so, as we tell the story of the vertebrates, time matters because vertebrates, the world starts off with no vertebrates. And then as we go uh, through time marching towards the present day, we start to uh, see more and more uh, groups. Now, um, during the Cambrian, this is the beginning of the Paleozoic era, uh, that's um, uh, 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 the period that has all of vertebrate history. Um, this is the first time when we get definite fossils of the chordates, all right? Um, although hemichordates might precede them just a little bit in the fossil record. Um, who cares? Well, as we'll see, um, these, ha uh, these animals are in the group which includes humans, meaning that they share features. In biology, um, member animals which are classified together in the same group, they share features. That's the reason you know, they are put in uh, this uh, group. Um, and one of the things that um, these uh, hemichordates uh, have is they have slits in their throat. This allows them to suck water in and um, the water can come out slits in their throat. Now, originally that was probably a great help in feeding, all right? So it allowed them to create a suction and the hemichordates, which are alive today, uh, they use this as a feeding mechanism. But then uh, what we refer to as primitive chordates like lancelets, they are the cousins of vertebrates, not quite vertebrates, but they have some of the features of vertebrates. They then put more blood vessels here. So these would be hemichordate worms. They have slits in their throat. 
Okay, so this worm is unlike most worms. Earthworms don't have slits in their throats, nematode worms don't have slits in their throat, um, but this hemichordate worm does. That's important. Okay, so um, this is a hemichordate worm and has slits in the throat and that helps it eat. The next group, while still an invertebrate, is called a chordate because it does something novel. It puts blood vessels in these um, uh, in these slits. And if you have blood vessels in these uh, slits, you can now do um, uh, something that the hemichordates couldn't do. You could breathe using these slits as gills. So as you suck water in and water leaves, um, the blood vessels here, they'll just take a little oxygen out of the um, uh, out of uh, the water as it leaves. And with more oxygen, you can now have um, a greater musculature, uh, which then uh, affects movement and affects, you know, so many aspects of life. So here's a fish, right? And you can see the slits in the throat are important for breathing. Water comes in the mouth, comes out the slits. But while it is there, there are blood vessels, aortic arches, which remove oxygen, um, and this now powers uh, muscles. So fish are active swimmers. The reason is they can get a great deal of oxygen to these muscles to power their contractions. But this great advance, which allowed for those um, that type of uh, swimming, evolved prior to the vertebrates in these early chordates. So as we go through time, that's one of the exciting parts. We can see the vertebrate body plan being built gradually in stages so that these chordates are not vertebrates, but they're almost vertebrates. They're squishy little invertebrates, maybe an inch or so long, worm-like, all right? But they have the same types of gills that um, vertebrates uh, have. They have, um, a notochord, a support rod going down their back. Now, the vertebrates will later replace the notochord um, with a vertebral column, as uh, we will uh, see. But the earliest fish did not really have a vertebral column, certainly not in the modern sense. Um, they had a notochord as their primary support rod. And so these uh, early wormy chordates going back to the beginning of the Cambrian, not only did they have slits in their throats, the type of gills that um, uh, vertebrates uh, uh, will have, uh, they then also had a notochord like vertebrates uh, will have. They had a post anal tail. And what I mean by that is if you look at where does the digestive tract end in uh, you know, a, an earthworm or a crayfish, it ends at the end of the body. So the anus ends where the body ends, the intestine uh, stretches the length of the body. However, in all vertebrates, um, the digestive system tract uh, ends prior to the tail and there's a post anal tail, uh, which has uh, uh, muscles. Um, another feature of uh, the vertebrates is that the nerve cord is on the back uh, and is hollow, as opposed to most invertebrates where uh, the nerve cord is on the front and is solid. Shortly after, there is evidence of chordates, which have these features. So in the early Cambrian, there are uh, chordates uh, which have these features which fish share, a throat with slits, a post-anal tail, a notochord, a, a dorsal hollow nerve cord. Um, then the first um, uh, fish uh, arise. Now, um, the uh, first uh, fish are known uh, from uh, fragments, okay? Um, uh, but the earliest fossils uh, are uh, fascinating. They are fossils of what are known as jawless fish. Now, jawless fish sound odd, but there are actually jawless fish alive today. So the very first fish in the fossil record look like this. There are fish that are known uh, from the early Cambrian, not the very beginning of the Cambrian, but shortly after those. So fish like Milo Conmingi and Hycoichthys, um, these are fish known from more than 500 million years ago. Notice, however, that they are not trout or marlin or um, 
uh, bass or shad or um, catfish, um, et cetera. Instead, they're an inch or two long, all right? They have no bone. They have no jaws, all right? They have a mouth. They don't have jaws. They have no pector or pelvic fins. And in fact, they look like those chordates. So those little wormy invertebrate chordates, you know, an inch or two long, look kind of like the first fish. So the first fish were uh, these little jawless things that would be filter feeders. And from these um, uh, jawless fish, uh, diversity of jawless fish uh, evolved, um, including the ancestors of the two kinds of jawless fish alive today. There are two kinds of jawless fish alive today, the hagfish and lampreys. Um, uh, so, um, uh, these uh, are the most primitive vertebrates alive today. And once again, if we were just looking at the history then of vertebrates, uh, vertebrates start in the Paleozoic era, the era of old life. Um, the first definite chordates are known from the beginning of the Cambrian. And then there are uh, primitive vertebrate fish, which resemble those early uh, chordates, also known from uh, the Cambrian. Now, from these earliest vertebrates, there would be a family tree which diversifies throughout these other eras and produces, you know, the different kinds of fish, amphibians, reptiles. Um, but some of the descendants of these first vertebrates, which were jawless, remain jawless. And that uh, then gives a rise to the most primitive vertebrates alive today. So if you would like to get an idea of, you know, primitive vertebrate biology, you're going to study the hagfish, um, or the lampreys. Um, and obviously, as we talk about the skeletal system, et cetera, in future um, uh, classes, uh, we'll be going through these. Now, even though um, uh, lampreys do have little pieces of cartilage, uh, which technically would be the, the start of a vertebral column, nevertheless, it is the notochord, which is the primary support rod. So those chordate cousins of vertebrates. They have a notochord. That is their um, uh, major uh, axial support, not a vertebral column. And the same thing with fish. Even though this is a fish, it doesn't have a backbone the way that you and I do. The notochord is still its primary um, uh, support. Uh, it doesn't have jaws. It has a mouth. It doesn't have a jaws. It has cartilage, but it does not have bone. Uh, and so it would be uh, from um, primitive um, uh, uh, chordates and then uh, 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 primitive uh, vertebrates. And um, as uh, I have uh, these videos, I go through it in, in greater detail, um, but not only would this lamprey have a very primitive skeletal system, say with cartilage, but not bone um, and not full vertebrae, but you could say the same about its heart. Right, the most primitive vertebrate hearts are found in these uh, jawless uh, fish. Uh, the most primitive brains among the vertebrates are found in uh, the jawless fish uh, as well. So here you see a lamprey. It has a mouth, but uh, no uh, jaws. Uh, that's me uh, holding one, which is, uh, has migrated up into uh, uh, the northeast. Uh, um, and so once again, as, uh, as we look at uh, the uh, vertebrates, uh, these are uh, the most primitive vertebrates alive uh, today, and uh, they have descended from uh, the jawless vertebrates, which would be the very first uh, vertebrates uh, in uh, the history of, uh, of vertebrates. Okay, so um, the Cambrian period, the first period of the uh, Paleozoic era, has vertebrates. There are fish. Um, uh, but once again, uh, these fish are not like the fish that we have today. There are no fish with uh, bones. And in fact, uh, these uh, earliest fish are only an inch or two long. Uh, they have uh, no pectoral and pelvic fins. Uh, they have uh, no uh, jaws. Um, and uh, it is uh, from them that we get uh, the uh, lampreys and hagfish. Um, but some of the fossil uh, jawless uh, fish, then evolved uh, a new uh, trait, uh, jaws. And so within the chordates, 
that's a phylum. There is a subgroup of vertebrates, that's a subphylum. And within the subphylum of vertebrates, there is a group called the nathostomes. These are the jawed uh, vertebrates. Now, uh, there are some, um, uh, some of these levels of classification have names, you know, so kingdom, phylum, you know, class, uh, order, uh, etc. And some don't. So nathostomes, it's a group, but not every group has to have, you know, a name uh, in that uh, sense. Now, um, now, in this overview, um, I would prefer not to get into the nitty gritty details about, say, you know, jaws and, and where it came from, because obviously in a comparative anatomy course, uh, you know, you very soon start studying the skeletal system. And so, you know, this is a topic for later. Um, but these evolutionary advances, you know, don't pop out of nowhere. The vertebrate body plan, the human body plan, was built in a very gradual a series of uh, stages. And so uh, those pharyngeal arches of the chordates and the jawless fish allowed them to breathe, but the jawless fish added cartilage here. And what happened was the first uh, pairs of cartilage bars uh, became uh, larger, uh, migrated forward and became more mobile. And this then is where jaws came from. And perhaps no other uh, advance in the history of vertebrates had as great uh, an effect on their lifestyle. Because prior to having jaws, um, vertebrates were food for larger invertebrates. So the world was full of, you know, sea scorpions and, you know, trilobites and anomalocarids and um, armored uh, squid. Those giant invertebrates ate the first vertebrates. They were the dominant predators uh, of the ocean and the tops of marine food chains. But after vertebrates evolved jaws, uh, then uh, in very short order, uh, vertebrates then came to be the tops of most food chains. And if you consider today, you know, obviously on land, you know, we have lions and tigers and bears and eagles and people and anacondas and, um, and crocodiles. Uh, but in the oceans, there are, you know, uh, killer whales and sharks and the like. Um, the tops of food chains are the vertebrates. And this evolution of jaws, once again, arguably one of the most important um, uh, developments in the history of vertebrates, it changed uh, their position in food chains. Now, uh, jawed vertebrates, these nathostomes, they first appear somewhere between the Ordovician and Silurian periods. So the Cambrian period is the earliest period of the Paleozoic era. And somewhere in the next two, the first jawed vertebrates uh, appear. And I uh, have these first two because uh, there are fragments of fossils which suggest that the Ordovician uh, might have been when they originated, but the first definite body fossils are from the Silurian. Um, it seems that the most primitive group of jawed vertebrates was a group known as the placoderms. They are extinct uh, today. There are no placoderms alive uh, today. They had heavy plates of uh, shield uh, armor uh, 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 over their uh, heads, um, uh, for uh, example. Um, they had definite pectoral fins, as you know, uh, we'll discuss with the skeletal uh, system, as did uh, the most advanced of the jawless vertebrates. We care about you know, uh, that because um, that is uh, the part of the fish from which arms would develop. Um, and then they also had pelvic fins. No jawless fish is known to have had pelvic um, uh, fins. Uh, that's the part of the skeleton from which uh, legs uh, uh, developed uh, later. They did not yet have teeth that would uh, come uh, uh, later. Um, so these are the most primitive jawed vertebrates, a group of fish known as the placoderms. Some of them could get to be 30 to 40 feet long, like Dunkleosteus uh, and others. And so you can see that once vertebrates evolved these jaws, that changed everything. They're no longer these small, you know, little um, uh, prey items in a world ruled by invertebrates. No, they are the tops of food chains, some 30 feet uh, long. Uh, so placoderms, 
are uh, anatomically the most primitive group of jawed uh, vertebrates. Uh, some were these huge um, uh, fish which swam in uh, the uh, middle of the ocean. Others uh, were probably uh, flattened for uh, life on the bottom. Uh, one group, the both real lepids, actually had joints in their pectoral fins and might actually have been able to come out and to, you know, uh, draw themselves not only along the bottom, say, of the ocean, uh, but then also on land uh, to a certain uh, degree. Now, they, these placoderms are uh, extinct. The mass extinctions at the end of the Devonian period, 350 million years ago, uh, this uh, wiped uh, out the placoderms were virtually so. The most primitive group of jawed vertebrates alive today is the class chondrichthys. Um, uh, these are the cartilaginous fish, which include the sharks, the rays, and deep water fish known as chimeras. The very earliest uh, sharks uh, apparently are uh, known from only fossils of scales, but not yet teeth. We think that teeth evolved uh, later, the placoderms did not have true teeth, and we, uh, it appears that the earliest uh, sharks uh, did not have uh, true teeth uh, either. Um, but then uh, by the uh, Silurian period, uh, there are, uh, there are uh, sharks certainly going into uh, the uh, Devonian. They were different sharks than alive today, so no modern sharks uh, were alive in the Paleozoic. For a while, there was some discussion about a rare endangered shark, I think off the coast of Japan, known as the frilled shark, whether that might be a very primitive offshoot. The last I read, that does not seem to be the case. Um, the mouths of uh, the, um, uh, the sharks were more forward facing as opposed to being subterminal, uh, which is uh, where it is on modern sharks. Um, the first sharks had a more prominent notochord and less of a vertebral column. So for the hundreds of millions of years of uh, sharks in the Paleozoic era, uh, they were primitive sharks, including the xenocanth sharks, uh, which could be large predators in fresh water. Uh, so jaws changed everything for the vertebrates and jawed fishes were uh, quite uh, successful. The placoderms, which are extinct today, and then a great diversity of extinct, um, uh, of extinct uh, sharks. Uh, so none of the Paleozoic sharks uh, are uh, alive uh, today. And they were quite diverse. A major reason that they were diverse is that bony fish would not achieve you know, their modern diversity until much later. And so it seems that uh, sharks uh, were more uh, varied uh, so that they uh, uh, they uh, took up some of the ecological niches occupied by, um, by bony fish uh, today. Um, the sharks that we have today, once again, uh, do not arise from uh, the Paleozoic era. Uh, the groups first came about in the, um, in the Mesozoic era. That was the time of the dinosaurs with many modern uh, species uh, occurring in uh, the Cenozoic era, uh, the quote, age of mammals in the last 65 uh, million years. And so while sharks are an ancient uh, group, the sharks we have today are not, they are not representatives of the most primitive um, uh, types of uh, sharks. Uh, the cartilaginous uh, fish uh, diversified. Uh, one group um, of ancient uh, sharks flattened their body. So instead of swimming in this S-shaped wriggle like this thrasher shark, where the vertebral column um, uh, laterally undulating was the, uh, the primary source of movement. Uh, some kept their back still, but then evolved much larger uh, pectoral fins. Uh, and it was the pectoral fins which then moved them forward. And we call these rays. Uh, so uh, stingrays, manta rays, uh, etc. Um, now sharks have a great uh, diversity of body plans, as you can see at the, as the one that just uh, swam by. And here you can see a ray. So a ray is a cartilaginous uh, fish related to uh, sharks, uh, but it has highly mo modified its pectoral fins to use them for movement as opposed uh, to the ancestral um, 
lateral undulation. Another group which evolved from uh, the ancestral sharks uh, were the chimeras. They are a group of deep water um, uh, cartilaginous fish. Uh, once again, uh, sharks have evolved over time. Uh, and so the group of sharks which we have today, uh, that group first originated in the Mesozoic era, but Mesozoic sharks included uh, many extinct forms like uh, Hydobus uh, here with its extra spines, which was a common shark during the age of, um, during the Mesozoic and the age of uh, dinosaurs. Um, another type of uh, uh, shark uh, was the uh, extinct cousin of, um, uh, of the great white uh, shark known as Megalodon. This was the largest predatory shark that we have a record of. So it could reach the size of the largest sharks alive today at 40 feet, um, but the largest sharks alive today, like the whale shark and basking shark, uh, they are not um, predators, uh, they filter feed. Uh, but Megalodon would have been a 40 foot long predatory uh, shark, and it evolved at a time when a number of mammal lineages uh, were adapting to life in the water, the early whales, but then also um, the demostylians, the uh, relatives of manatees, uh, a lot of the early elephants were semi-aquatic. And so when uh, mammals first started to adapt to a life in uh, the ocean, uh, there was the largest uh, predatory shark uh, in uh, history. So as we look at vertebrates, uh, which is a subphylum, we could break them into subgroups. You know, so smaller than a phylum, we would get to class. So there's the jawless uh, fish, um, uh, the class uh, Agnathans. Those are the jawless fish alive today. There's uh, the uh, class uh, Chondrichthys. That would be the cartilaginous uh, fish. Um, all other uh, fish are bony fish. Uh, Osteichthians, and we would actually be in that Osteichthian group descended from the bony fish. Um, there is a group of fossil fish which may be transitional uh, between the, um, uh, the sharks and the bony fish. They have bone, but they have a very shark-like body, and they seem to be intermediate. They are known as Acanthodians, so a group known as Acanthodians. Um, are very, very uh, interesting. Now, as we classify uh, life, uh, sometimes new fossil finds uh, will, um, uh, will uh, propose uh, alternate classification schemes. And so are Acanthodians directly intermediate in between sharks and bony fish? Do they represent stem sharks so that uh, uh, before there were you know, sharks in the class we have today, you know, were there uh, primitive forms which were shark-like but not yet sharks? And so we could argue a little bit about the place of this a group called the Acanthodians in uh, the family tree, uh, but they have traits of both uh, the um, the sharks and uh, the bony uh, fish. Um, once bony fish evolved, uh, there were two types of bony fish, even from uh, the outset. Uh, the earliest uh, fish were very primitive. Um, so, you know, when bony fish first appear, there were no bass or trout, et cetera. And there were two types of fin, what's known as a ray fin. Um, and uh, this type of fish is known as a, an actinopterygian. Uh, so the fin is made of cartilage rays and the muscles which move the, uh, the fin are in the body wall. So imagine like in the chest, you can pull from there, as opposed to a different type of fin known as the sarcopterygian uh, fin. This is another group of uh, fish, uh, which is more interesting uh, with relation uh, to, um, uh, to uh, the vertebrates on land. So once uh, the uh, bony fish appear in the late Silurian, uh, and almost immediately afterwards, uh, there are fish, you know, we can classify in these two separate groups. So this division in uh, the uh, fish goes back 
to the beginning. Um, the Actinopterygian uh, fish, the ray fin fish, they're exciting because almost every fish alive today is a ray fin fish, and they are the most successful kind of vertebrate. All right, so there are as many teleost fish, that's the major group of the ray fin fish, uh, there are as many teleost fish as there are birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians combined. All right, so you know, fish are quite successful, and by far the most successful group of fish are the ray finned actinopterygian fish. The sarcopterygian fish with their lobe fins are not uh, as common as uh, diverse, um, but uh, they are exciting uh, with the evolution of amphibians, as we will see. Now, among the ray fins, uh, teleos make up almost every fish alive today, um, but they are not the first ray fin fish. So here you see a sturgeon, and a sturgeon um, is a, a primitive branch of the bony ray fin uh, fish. If you look, it has this shark-like tail, um, and as uh, we'll see later, its scales are very primitive, looking like, you know, big teeth, you know, being very bright white because they have, uh, these scales are made of uh, enamel. And so uh, the bony fish evolved in stages. Not all of uh, the fish were present from uh, the beginning. And in fact, the teleost fish, which is the major group of fish alive today, which make up almost every um, uh, fish that we see, uh, they first appear in the Mesozoic era with uh, the dinosaurs. So here you can see uh, one of these more primitive bony fish known as a chondrostian. Now that's a sturgeon. Here's a gar that is also a primitive um, uh, bony uh, fish, which is not a teleos. And here you can see a bowfin. Uh, it's not moving because it's dead. Uh, but you can notice this prominent uh, fin that it has. Uh, the bow fin is also a primitive um, uh, bony fish. So the ray fin fish, they are um, the dominant type of fish, uh, but their dominant group are the teleos, which appear um, maybe 200 million years after the first bony fish. So vertebrates have changed over time, uh, and certainly, you know, the fish have. So the bass and trout and sunfish, the marlin, uh, the uh, anchovies, uh, the flounders, um, uh, the cod, all of uh, the teleost fish, which make up the vast majority of fish alive uh, today, they their groups first originate in the um, uh, in the Mesozoic era with uh, the dinosaurs. And if you were to ask, when do our species of, you know, of catfish first appear or bass, uh, et cetera, it's uh, much uh, later uh, in, uh, in time. And so um, uh, uh, this then is uh, the history of the, um, uh, of uh, the teleos. And once again, just to uh, to emphasize uh, one last time. Um, so fish first appeared 500 million years ago, um, but the oceans were not full of fish, you know, the way that we think of, uh, you know, fish certainly not in the ones that we are uh, familiar with, um, but rather uh, the fish started off as these small jawless uh, uh, fish. Then uh, uh, somewhere between the Ordovician and uh, the Silurian uh, were the first jawed fish. Uh, the first bony fish appear by the end of the Silurian, uh, but it's not until the Triassic uh, period in the Mesozoic era that we get teleost fish um, and that uh, modern genera and species, many of them arise only in the Cenozoic uh, era. So vertebrates have uh, changed over time. Now the Sarcopterygian fish, uh, they, uh, began as, you know, a very primitive, uh, you know, there are primitive forms like Saurolepis. And uh, there are a few which are still alive today, like lungfish, like coelacanths. Um, but they were far more common in the Devonian uh, period. And the exciting thing about uh, them is it was this group that evolved lungs. All right, and so as you know, we can discuss uh, later, some fish can breathe atmospheric air. Uh, lungfish actually have true 
uh, lungs. And so a lot of what will make the amphibians successful evolved in their fish ancestors, just like a lot of what made the fish successful evolved in their chordate ancestors. And so over tens of millions of years, Sarcopterygian fish uh, gradually evolved uh, the features of the first uh, tetrapods. Tetrapods would include the amphibians and the amniotes, uh, which evolved, um, uh, which evolved uh, from them. Uh, now, once again, that sounds odd, but remember, you know, the hemichordates, they had um, those slits in their throat, which they used as, you know, to get food before uh, uh, they were used to breathe. And so uh, the first gills took advantage of something that was already there and just modified it. Um, jaws were derived from gill arches. So jaws took advantage of something which was already there and just modified. And if we look at the most primitive uh, of these Sarcopterygian fish, they had a series of bones all in a, um, uh, a row. Uh, but by the time we get to the Devonian period, there are uh, fish uh, whose fins have bones which we recognize. So if we look at, say, Eusthenopteron and, you know, ask in its front fins, what bones uh, did it have? And we would say, oh, I recognize this layout. And we wouldn't have to pick Eusthenopteron, we can pick others. And you could say, ah, oh, I recognize there's one bone in the upper fin, which we call the humerus. Uh, there's two bones in the next section, which we call the radius and ulna. And we have bones which articulate uh, with that. And so just like uh, the early chordates, they uh, evolved features which would uh, then become more advanced in uh, the vertebrates. Here we have these fish fins. These are all fish, but they have the bones that amphibian arms and legs would possess. So the fish ancestors of amphibians evolved lungs. The fish ancestor and, uh, of amphibians evolved the bones we associate with arms um, uh, and, uh, and uh, legs. Uh, and so uh, amphibians are modified fish, fish which adapted uh, to uh, uh, to life on land. So here you can see one of those lungfish. Notice it, ha it has a very different type of fin than most fish. But notice that it's going up to the surface to take a gulp of air and bring this air into its lungs. And so uh, while uh, lungfish do have gills and they are breathing oxygen out of the uh, water using their gills, they also have lungs so that they can go up to the surface and take a uh, gulp of air uh, as well. And so here you can see, um, and this is a Sarcopterygian fish. So while there are two different kinds of bony fish or Osteichthyan fish, amphibians are more closely related to the Sarcopterygian uh, branch um, than they are to the Actinopterygian uh, uh, branch. Um, and so as we look at the end of the Devonian, for the first time, we see amphibians. But these amphibians are not frogs and uh, salamanders, uh, but uh, rather these are very primitive forms that still have a number of features of their fish ancestors. They still have a fish-like tail. They still have internal gills. Um, they don't, uh, the first ones may not have an ankle. Uh, they still have a notochord running through their vertebral um, uh, uh, column. They don't yet have five fingers and toes. Acanthostega has eight, Ichthyostega has seven, Tularpeton has six. So these are uh, not modern amphibians. They are transitional. Uh, while they are amphibians, they uh, have some features of their fish uh, ancestors. Uh, so just like fish evolved in stages before we get to modern groups, uh, so too uh, did amphibians evolve in uh, stages before we get to modern groups. Now, amphibians would be the first vertebrates on land. Reptiles would come later. And amphibians uh, would uh, diversify into a number of uh, groups which are extinct uh, today. Uh, some lost their legs and were snake-like. Um, they are not uh, with us today, uh, the aestopods. Um, then there was a, a great diversity, including some which got to be 
quite large, six feet long, nine feet long, um, even um, uh, even uh, longer. And so amphibians uh, have uh, produced a number of uh, lineages, uh, many of which are not extinct uh, today. And for a, you know a while, amphibians were not only the only um, uh, uh, vertebrates on land, uh, but for a while they were the dominant predators uh, on land. One even approached um, uh, 30 feet and was uh, you know, uh, rather uh, crocodile-like. Um, these large amphibians would then even uh, persist into the, um, uh, the Mesozoic era alongside uh, the uh, dinosaurs. And so uh, the Paleozoic era was exciting. It not only did it witness the very first of the um, and the very first vertebrates at the beginning of the Paleozoic. Um, but uh, uh, in the early, uh, the first half of the Paleozoic, there were diverse kinds of fish that evolved, a fish that evolved jaws, fish that evolved uh, bone, fish that became uh, adapted to land with lungs and uh, bones in their fins matching arm and leg bones. And by the middle of the Paleozoic era, uh, there were actually then uh, amphibians, vertebrates living on land. Now, uh, lots of groups uh, of amphibians evolved, but many have become uh, extinct. Uh, I have uh, uh, some videos here about uh, the diversity of the amphibians, which uh, we have um, uh, today. So today, uh, once again, if we were to then take class amphibia, uh, we could then uh, break that into different orders all right, so there could be, you know, the order of uh, frogs, the tailless ones, or anora. Uh, there could be um, the order of salamanders and the order of the legless uh, Sicilians. Um, so uh, beef, uh, these all evolve in the Mesozoic era. So the first amphibians are from the Devonian, uh, the, but the first um, uh, representatives of the three orders of modern uh, amphibians, uh, they appear in the Mesozoic era. So the, the thing that I'm trying to, to build up on is there's this great family tree um, where the big groups, they appear earlier in time, but then as you go into smaller and smaller groups, we associate that with, um, uh, with uh, later uh, groups. Uh, so, you know, the, the frogs represent an order um, but then we could split that into suborders, and these suborders arose at different uh, periods of uh, of time. And I go through um, a, a uh, some videos with these uh, orders. The same thing is true of the salamanders. Prior to the Mesozoic era, there were no salamanders. Just as prior to the Mesozoic era, uh, there uh, were no frogs, uh, and we can split the salamanders into uh, different um, uh, different uh, sub uh, uh, orders, okay? Um, and then finally, uh, there is a third group of amphibians alive today, a legless group of amphibians known as Sicilians. The very first uh, fossil Sicilians uh, possessed uh, legs, uh, but then after that, uh, the legs were lost and then all uh, Sicilians alive uh, today, which do not, they don't live in the United States, um, so uh, we find them uh, more in uh, tropical uh, uh, regions. Um, so here is a uh, Sicilian. Uh, and so I, I'm going to, to end this uh, first part of vertebrate history and the next part, um, pick up with it. Um, but just before studying vertebrate anatomy, um, two things which will come up again and again is one, the grouping of vertebrates. So when we talk about skeletal systems or, or brains or hearts, you know, this is what we see in this group or that group. And so understanding, you know, not only the groups, but how they fit together in the great um, family tree of the vertebrates uh, is important. Um, but also then the idea of time, all right, because the vertebrate body plan was built over you know time, and so we you know uh, as we study each system, we'll point to you know it was at this point in our history that the first members of you know this group evolved lungs or evolved the bones and the fins, which we would call the humerus, the radius, uh, the ulna, uh, etc. So uh, this wraps up part one of the history of vertebrates.